someone mentioned the Rocky theme, how do we not get the Rocky theme going up? I can't believe I've never thought of that before. Kudos to Ben for making that happen. So yeah, I love chicken wings, but the other thing that I love also is random facts. And so as we're going through today, I just want to tease out some of the things that I heard. So I think it was Agnes who talked about from 2000, 50% of the Fortune 500 companies are now been replaced. So fun fact is from 2008, or sorry, from 2016, 17 now in the next eight years, 50% of the S&P 500 are gonna be replaced. And they're gonna be replaced predominantly from or by technology companies. Someone had mentioned that we uh, embrace the shared, shared passion, I believe, or shared purpose. Did you know that Tesla and Elon Musk has openly said RIP is free for anyone to use? And so I'm gonna talk about the sharing economy and how that's fundamentally changing too. And one other fun fact, it was Corey. Corey, you had on your slide deck a bunch of pictures of the flowers, which was so perfect because we're in the botanical gardens. So I've read this, that if you were to get a jar of flowers, and you were to put some Viagra into the water, the stems will stay firm for a week longer than if you didn't. So there is some random facts right there. <clears throat> As Travis pointed, or I, Travis, I think you rated this point in, unintentionally, one of the greatest gifts you can get a presenter is laughing, so thank you for laughing at my jokes. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to try to make it fun, as Greg had pointed out. I don't take myself too seriously in the way I dress and the way I speak. Um, but I hopefully, through this presentation, you're going to see there's actually a lot of rigor behind my experiences and that I'm not just talking uh, from things that I read on Google. So I was reminded at our session outside that I am vertically challenged. And <laughs> thanks for the laugh. Thank you. I, yeah, I just don't have that gene. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of story because the truth is, is that it hasn't handicapped me in any way. And in fact, being short or vertically challenged as the photographer so graciously put it, um, it's actually created a lot of experiences for me that have shaped my life and things that maybe if I were taller wouldn't have happened. So I'd like you to imagine really deeply what I'm about to tell you the story because it makes it more powerful. When I was about 22 months old, I was in my mother's hotsy totsy convertible car with my three-year-old brother. And he was tall enough to see out the window, but I wasn't. And so being the, you know, the caring brother he is, he gives me a little push out of the car. So out Rocky goes. We don't laugh at that part. But the problem was the car was going 60 kilometers an hour. And so I flew out the car, Davin, and <laughs> hit the pavement. Luckily, thanks for that. Luckily, a BC Tel truck, which is now called Tel, saw this unfold and cut off traffic and blocked anyone from running me over. I spent a week in ICU with a swollen cranium, as they put it. But I'm here today, and that story wouldn't have happened if I wasn't vertically challenged. But the other reason I tell you that story is because it anchors on what I'm talking about today is in terms of change. See, when that happened, there was no cell phone to call 911. There were no dash cams to record, which would have been an epic home video to use against my brother forever. There was certainly car seats weren't a thing, I'm guessing, as I was just pushed right out. And despite the fact that there was ample room in the ambulance, my mom chose to leave my brother at the closest house, house with a perfect stranger. And so the world that was back then is almost unrecognizable to us today. And while that might not be surprising to anybody, I think there's a story here is that it's not that change is new. Changes always happen. Change will continue to happen in the world, but it's the pace of which it's happening now. And so we often use the term of exponential change. So today, what I'm gonna talk about is change, but in the context of the, of the workplace specifically, and how many people are now anchoring on this term of the future of work, which I believe, of course, is now. So, <clears throat> Many people talk about, actually, I think what I should also mention is that more than not just believing that the future is now is that I'm on a personal mission to change the vernacular because I think so often, I don't know if it's implicit, maybe you just raise your hands, you believe this, but so many times we talk about this future work as if it's coming, that something maybe down the road, it's gonna affect me later. The reality is it is here now. It's gonna be here now for most of you, and if it's not today, it's gonna to be tomorrow or very soon. And so as I present to, on this topic, which I do quite often, I get sometimes challenged. Um, what makes you, you know, uh, some kind of an expert in this field? I'm not sure I am the expert, but here's what I'd love to tell you. 
is that we all have this story of our careers and our lives, and we all have interesting stories. One of the things that I'm quite aware of in my life is I've been very intentional about the decisions I've made throughout my life. And so let me guide you through my career for a little while. When I was 15, actually I think I was about 14 years old, I started working at a Baskin Robbins ice cream, scooping ice cream. And I knew then that I was different than most. I cared about deeply about the guest experience. I wanted every scoop of ice cream to be perfectly weighted. My cash better have been right to the penny or that wasn't good enough for me. And that place better have been spotless. So despite being the youngest person on staff, I felt I was as good, if not better, than anyone on that job because I was engaged and I had a workplace I loved. I got fired. I got fired because some other dork who wasn't as engaged as I was decided it was a good thing to steal the ice cream. And so the owners, a small entrepreneurial couple, I'm suspecting, 14-year-old Asian guy with blonde hair with a skateboard every day probably was the guilty one. The good news was for me is that we worked next, or I worked next to a KFC restaurant. So that's right, Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. KF to chicken, steaks, ribs, cornbreads, the whole deal. And what I had learned, what I found out is that I could switch my scoop of ice cream, I get two, two scoops a day per diem they called it, and I could switch that with a two piece meal for someone that worked with they got each day. And so through that I built a relationship. And when I was let go of that job, I told some of the people there what happened, they said that would never have happened here. I said, why not? Said, we got a union. Oh, fascinating. What's that? I'm 15 years old. What does that mean? He says, you can't get fired. <laughs> well, sounds good to me. I need a job. I don't want to get fired again, especially when I work so hard. So I worked at KFC. And we had one of the most amazing cultures there. We gamified everything. We said who could bread the chicken the fastest, who was the first one to fall behind uh, in the rush, this major rush in Kentucky Fried Chicken that happens at 5 o'clock. And if you don't have enough chicken in that, in that warmer, you're hooped. So we had an amazing time. And then all of a sudden, things got awkward for us. So we all worked so hard, we all cared, we all knew we had jobs, but then, how come when there was a job opening, someone from a restaurant 20 miles away got the promotion? And so I started to question the value of that, of that union. And when our job steward left at 16 years old, I took over. And so I was a job steward now. And I was able to see the ins and outs of the union and the management relationship. And it was then, also, by the way, I got to sit in on some collective bargaining just as a, as, as a, to, to witness that, um, as not necessarily participate, but I was afforded those opportunities. So the point was, is, is that by 16 years old, I knew I wanted to be in a profession that I could affect people in the workplace, because I f saw that happen even at 15. So I go to the counselors and they said, okay, Rocky, this is what it's called, it's called human resources. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Tell my parents. They didn't know what human resources was. No one knew what human resources was, in fact, at the time. All I knew is that when I finally got to university at Simon Fraser University, I found out that 90% of the, of the class were women. It was like, yes, that's the best <laughs> choice that I could ever have made in my entire career. So I wanted to give you that context because ever since then, like I said, I've been very intentional about studying and living the workplace. So I got a little bit pigeonholed after leaving university because I was good at operations and running restaurants. And I worked my way up to the general manager of a Condé Nast ranked resort in the Canadian Rockies. I was also the vice president of the Hotel Association, started my first startup tech company, and was a top 30 under 30. So I was a pretty achieving person. But something was missing. Two things. One is that I needed to be around people. But the value was that I learned to be a general manager. And I think quite often HR professionals wrongfully are told you don't, get, you don't have business acumen. And so I never had that challenge because I'd seen a P&L and I had run sales and marketing, et cetera. But I pivoted. I pivoted to go back into the place where I felt I belonged the most and that was in HR. So I moved back to Vancouver and I joined a company of about 300 employees. And I led their HR and of course their food and beverage just because. And it was a great experience for me. I was intentional again. So, so this is a small company in my eyes. I need to work for a bigger company. And I want to get more union experience again. So I joined an organization of 2,000 uh, employees and helped grow them to 3,000 and get acquired by a company, a multinational of half a million employees worldwide. And I was their senior director. And so that was getting me the exposure of union drives and collective bargaining agreement at the highest level, managing a fairly large team. Then what was missing? You don't have corporate experience. 
Because despite the fact there's a large organization, I question whether it had the rigor and disciplines around running a real business with shareholders and boards, et cetera, like something like in Toronto, for example. We lack that, generally speaking, in Vancouver. Well, I found out there were a few organizations that subscribed to organizational theories, things like requisite organizations. And I joined that company because I wanted to see what it was like. And thankfully for me, our CEO actually came from Toronto, from Canadian Tire, who was a senior executive there and came out. And I worked under that CEO for a year and learned so much about real corporate enterprise and the issues that we face versus an entrepreneurial environment versus uh, other sectors I've been in. And then something happened around 2010. I remember that because it was the Olympics in Vancouver. It was an epic time. A light went off. As LinkedIn became more and more powerful, the pumping out the content about what was happening, particularly in Silicon Valley, it was very clear to me that the future of work was in tech. And it's in startup tech. And so I will pause for a second and say, suggest this. This hand here, if this is startup culture and this is enterprise corporate, I would suggest that the future is going to be closer to here. I'm not saying there's a lot of things that, that I'll talk about where startups go wrong, but that's what I felt and I feel and now that I've been here strongly believe. So I took a while trying to get into the startup. Vancouver has a booming tech space, and it took me a year to find work in startup. Why? Because every time I applied for a job, I was told I was too corporate. It says, you don't get us. And if you go in a startup, they have this bit of an arrogance around corporate is dead, HR is dead, performance reviews are dead, email is dead, everything is dead. And they don't embrace that diversity, at least back then. So when I finally got into an organization that would hire me as a startup, that is where I started to really feel what the future of work was. What I read was real. I'm not going to lie to you. I called bullshit on so many things when I got there. I think you actually need that beer tap and big ping pong table to improve engagement. Do you actually need to collaborate on everything? Why would you have a non-manager opine into the strategy? This makes no sense to me. And then I would walk up and say we'd have a town hall and I would go up there in my corporate hat and say, hey, we have three key messages today. It's this, this, and this, because that's what we would have done in enterprise. In the first six months in the job in that startup, they wanted my head. They said, you've got to fire him. He doesn't get our space. And I didn't get them either, but I stuck with it. And over time now, they're now onto my third startup. I've my own, I started onto my second startup and I've worked for three startups and consulted dozens. And I'm realizing now, like I said, what is happening there is real. And I'm gonna explain why in a minute. So hopefully that gives in context. Actually, before I get there, I should also say today, I do have a full-time job. I'm the vice president of the BC Tech Association. And I also have Now Innovation, which is my consulting company, which is anchored totally on transforming businesses. And I think that while I don't have all the answers, hopefully it gives some street cred there, that I live your life. So whether you're in the audience today, you're a startup, you're a five-person company, you're in hospitality, if you're a 25,000-person company, I've been in your shoes in HR at the most senior executive level. And I'm bringing you, I'm sharing you my knowledge and experiences and why the Now of Work is so important and why it's here today. So one thing I am not is a scientist. Sitting with Ashton, where's Ashton? We talked about being visual and 80%. That number came out that we learned visually. Here's how I would articulate what is happening in this evolution uh, curve here in, in a visual. This is Bartholomew's, I call him. Bart lived in the beginning of work. And he was literally bowing down just trying to figure out how to feed his family and himself to live. Work and life were synonymous. You fast forward a few hundred million years, and this is Larry. Larry has had profound impact on the world post-Second Industrial Revolution. The way we've created this world economy and the disciplines around even hierarchy and process and shareholder value, and the world moved quickly. Unfortunately for Larry, though, this is now the legacy of work. And this is, or the low point, I would suggest, in the context. Why? Because through this desire to create wealth and, dare I say, greed, I think often came at the expense of health, faith, family, friends. And now people were starting to live to work, putting themselves at risk. So then you started hearing, okay, John is with startup but innovative companies. You know what? There is this future work. And I had a choice. I could have done a graphic of a hipster or I could have done a graphic of a robot. I chose a robot. But either way, whether it's a young person or a robot, 
This brings a level of uncomfortableness to a lot of people in the workplace. That this future is coming, and it's not what I want to see coming. And so the future work, which you often hear about, is automation and AI and machine learning and AR, VR, and MR, and that we're going to lose jobs. Well, I'm here to tell you today that, number one, the future work is not a future. It's here today. But it looks more like Nairobi. And so all this fear that's going around in my experience, I think that the future of work is one in which we bring back work and life being synonymous. And it's going to be anchored so much on what I'm going to talk about this connected generation. So if there's one thing you can take away today, my experience is working in an enterprise, knowing how hard it is to, to convince the executive that something is coming. Working in startups or, or in, and the corporations saying startups are irresponsible. What they do is not scalable and it's only for small companies. And working in startups where they said that corporates are dead and that we never need that rigor. Well, you know what, when you have shareholders, that will change. Having those both lenses, I'm confident in saying this is actually the now of work and it's not that scary. So let's just talk about why the now of work is even coming in the first place. I believe that there are three main forces, the connected generation technology and the sharing economy. Let's start with the millennials. I'll get to what I mean by connected generation in a second, but I do believe, number one, that generations, we should never um, generalize some of their characteristics. I think it's just a condition more of what they've experienced in life. Kat, you and I talked about that earlier at lunch. But there are some fundamentals around millennials I think we should all be aware of. Number one, they were parented differently. And if we're talking about how work and life are going to be synonymous, is it that far of a stretch to say that what you experience and how you're raised as a child is going to filtrate your work experience? I don't think it's a stretch. So if you got the medal just for participating, I know when I was growing up, dinner sounded like this. Rocky, we're having lasagna. Glad we're eating. This generation was told, hey, Johnny, you want lasagna or chicken for dinner? I want sushi. OK, we'll have sushi. This level of input and collaboration, this is what they were raised with. And so that's a fundamental difference that never existed before. Secondly, they have someone to look up to. They have role models. When I was growing up, there was no 20-something-year-old making billions of dollars and changing the world. Well, today, from the Mark Zuckerberg's onward, particularly in startup, they're showing that, you know what? I can do, do things differently. I can change the world, because that's what my parents told me. Do whatever you love. Don't make mistakes that I made. Change the world. And they can. And you start looking even at athletes are becoming younger. Our models and our actresses are kind actors are becoming younger. And so they're seeing and saying, you know what? I can, in fact, change the world, unlike any generation before. And I'll talk also because of why technology impacts that. The third thing is, is like to blow shit up. And so this is a common thing. I've worked with thousands of millennials, and you're going to see I've done a ton of data and, and research behind this. There is something about millennial that says, I will break everything that exists today. And it's not just for the sake of breaking stuff, but maybe it is the nurturing from their parents to say, don't get caught with the golden handcuffs. Don't do what I did. And maybe that's psychological. Or part of it is just they're empowered because of pace of change that they've been through. And I'm telling you, they just want to blow everything up. Fourthly, the balance of power has changed. So when I think back to my time, when I had my first jobs in my 20s, I had to put on a suit. I had to refine my resume. I had to wow that hiring manager and that recruiting team to hire me. And I left knowing that my career, my job was left in the hands of that person. Today, in a digital economy, who do you think holds that power? The, the skills and the knowledge that most companies need today are the ones that the young people have. And when these young people are coming out of university and going down to invade innovative companies, not just tech companies, but the tech companies are notorious for saying, here's $20,000 just to sign. And then getting six-figure incomes if you're in engineering, so right out of university, you don't think there's going to be a chip on the shoulder? You don't think that's going to translate again into the workplace? I believe it does. And if you don't believe the narrative that I've outlined as before, and you're a data person, then I would suggest this, the numbers don't lie. You heard it earlier today. 50% of the workforce by 2020 will be millennials. They are the largest cohort in the workplace today, and by 2025, they will make up 75% of the workforce worldwide. That's just millennials. So now when I talk about the connected generation, what am I saying? Well, I'm saying this. The centennials, or the Gen Zs, they're working here now. Then you've got these Gen Xs, like me, who what I'm looking for in a workplace is far closer to what a millennial wants than what a baby boomer wants. 
So when you net those together, you're looking at 2020 upwards of 70% of the workforce are going to be connected generation and upwards of 85% by 2025. These are hard facts. These are numbers. And I'm not here to suggest that all of us think the same, but I'm telling you that the trends that we're seeing and the work environments that innovative companies are creating resonate with them more than, than what's happening before. Your cutoff, by the way, will be the baby boomers. As you go through change, make sure you have an intense change management plan because the baby boomers are going to be the most resistant and you need them. And there are ways, by the way, to get them engaged. So second thing, technology. Should be no surprise, technology, I'm arguing here that every one of you in this room, either A, works for a tech company today, or B, works for a company, a sector, a profession that is gonna be innovated or disrupted or be made redundant by technology, and it's gonna happen faster than you think. And so we talked about Airbnb and Uber as examples, and those are great examples. But the other way technology has changed is the workplaces internally, so we've heard from Igloo, and I talked about some of the fatigue with adopting all these tools. Technology and the way you work, whether it's Slack as a communication tool or Igloo or your other intranets, technology is coming into the workplace at a faster rate than ever before and it's gonna change the way you do business. And the final force that's causing this now of work is the sharing economy. And I think this is probably the one that doesn't get talked about enough. I break the sharing economy into three areas. We have the sharing of goods and services, Uber, Airbnb. We have the redistribution of goods and services. So this is like your Craigslist and your Kijiji's and your Oodles of the world. But the most important one to me is the knowledge and sharing economy. And we're starting to see democratizing of almost all of industries. We're seeing that in education as well, where you can now learn. University is putting the courses on for free online. Whether it's Udemy or if it's lynda.com, we have democratized the way we're learning and sharing. And so in, the, in this economy here, with knowledge, there's that. There's also the gig economy. And the gig, someone talked about contingent workforce to, earlier today. By 2020, 60% of the workforce will be contingent. Now, it's a little bit of an odd stat because it includes part-time workers, but this is, not an, this is not to be underscored. The connected generation, whether it's for economic reasons or for personal interest, will have side jobs, especially your top talent. They are involved in this gig economy. Or the gig economy is gonna say, I'm gonna work for you for two years. And millennials in particular get this bad rap of you're not loyal, you leave after two years. And that's not the case in my opinion. It's actually more of a function of they want different experiences. Go back to their parenting again. Do things differently than I did. You know, I have all these regrets. And so now they actually can. So when millennials leave after two years, don't look at them as if they're not loyal because they might come back to you five or six or 10 years down the road if you have a great culture. Or you might find that people choose to work for three companies at once versus one. The way in which the gig economy people work is fundamentally changing. And the last area of sharing economy is the, um, the whole idea of open source. How many of you have heard the term open source? Awesome. And so this is not just Tesla. It's happening in HR. It's happening with engineers. So you're going to say, we can move this world faster if we share. And again, if you go back to the boom, I don't want to be harp on the baby boomers, but they lived in a world of IP. IP was everything, whether it was a patent or the way they, had, they hired people with their culture. That's all gone. The more you share, the better we win. And when you put yourself into the mindset of the connected generation, aren't they on their phone sharing every day? Do they have any hesitation of putting their credit card online, sharing personal information? They don't. And so if work and life are balancing and becoming one, that's what's happening in the workplace as well. So this is what's causing the now of work. So then the question becomes, who is it going to affect? And I'm going to say to you, everybody, it's just a matter of when. And I can't predict when it's going to happen for all of you, but here's what I would say. If you work in tech today and or very forward thinking companies, and I've worked with a ton, even some of the big companies in, in this country who are becoming more innovative, the now of work is here today. So when I describe to you what it looks like, they're practicing that. But I also believe that whether it's through someone in the connected generation, whether it's through technology or through a sharing economy, is gonna disrupt even government. It's gonna disrupt trade unions. It's gonna disrupt even the mafia. We are all gonna go through a fundamental shift in the way we work. 
So that comes to the question of what does the now work look like? As I went through and uh, through my experiences, one of the things that I found being in startup was that they didn't actually do engagement type surveys. And so when you try to introduce a corporate one, it was written in, a, in poor language, it was too long, it wasn't mobile friendly. So I know that Vera is really big on data and that whatever you present today has to be driven by that. So in the bottom right hand corner there is a company called Starfish that I founded a few years ago. And Starfish is an engagement tool specifically for tech and forward thinking companies. And over the course of since launching, we have surveyed thousands and thousands of people. We have also spoken in front of universities because that's one of our target market is tracking how do you feel about work in your fourth year versus your of university versus your first, second, third, fifth year of work and seeing if there have been changes. And so what I'm showing you here is based on science and data. And these are probably not earth shattering to any of you, but what's important to me today now is that they're becoming validated. So we all kind of knew that no one likes hierarchy but now, through the, through, again, through this data tool, we're finding out that this actually does matter. So let me go through what, if, what these actually mean. Non-hierarchical non, non doesn't mean you don't have levels. I get that, we all should get that. You need management, you have different levels in which people operate better. But what it does mean, it was referenced earlier today as well, is that a non-manager should be able to put forward a creative idea right to the top that there needs to be, as we see in the next one, transparency. So the hierarchy is more about, I should not be bogged down by a title. It also means that the most important people in your job, or at least, sorry, the ones that are most paid, aren't necessarily the ones at the highest level. Who are your most people in the tech company? Probably your top engineers. And so they're remunerated based on that value versus a level in the hierarchy. And that's what we're unearthing through this study. Trust and transparency. So I'll throw it out there. Transparency is sharing everything but your balance sheet. Imagine your workplace. If the strategy was there, the P&L was open for everyone, if what everyone else was working on was open to everyone else in the organization. That's what we're talking about, transparency. We talked about innovation and agility. I th maybe it sounds obvious, but imagine your workplace. If the company was committed to always evolving both your culture and your product. If you weren't stuck in bureaucracy and you weren't stuck in process, that you could be agile to reflect the ways in which the business is evolving. This is one of the things when we talk about um, the annual performance review, review being dead, it's because a year from now, how can you predict in today's world what your world's gonna look like then? And so we're seeing at the very minimum, or the very most, it's quarterly. I'm gonna propose to you in a minute or a few minutes here of how you could even pivot every two weeks that's being agile and not being so focused on a waterfall or a long-term strategy. Remote and flexible workplace. So some of the tools I'm gonna to introduce, I think I've talked to a lot of people. I know Matt himself, you're a remote worker. And this is a real thing. If you're not doing this today, then get on the bus. So imagine your workplace where all that matters is the work you get done. Does it matter where you, where you do it? Does it matter how you do it? Does it matter what time you work and where? No. At the end of the day, it's about the results, but frameworks can help that process, which I'm gonna talk about. Highly collaborative, this is the big thing we're seeing is cross-functional collaboration. So it's one thing to be collaborative within your team, but imagine your workplace, if teams cross-functionally worked on projects better. This is what they're asking for. They wanna be more involved with project cross-functionally. Constant feedback, um, I don't know what your cadence is, but it should be daily that you're talking to your team members, and I would say more formally, even weekly. And again, if you look at the connected generation in this instant gratification world, where they're on their phone and they're Snapchat and they're Instagram, they're constantly getting feedback from their friends, this is what they want in the workplace as well. So commit to that. Imagine workplace if you had the best tools. If your team members want Apples or iMacs, give them iMacs. If they want a service, give them a service. Get them the best software. Have kick-ass Wi-Fi. These are table stakes for the connected generation. You have to give them tools to succeed. And if you don't, you will lose them to other companies. Second last is personal development. And so I write personal because now we're moving to a world where if work and life are one, it's not just about developing them as a professional and how to get your next job or be better at what you do. We talked about investing in hobbies earlier today. 
This is what you need to do, is to invest in them personally. A happy employee, someone said this, is a, we're at one of our lunch, happy employees, a productive employee, 100%. Start looking at your professional development budgets and your programs and start infusing personal uh, growth as well. That could be helping them run a marathon. It could be investing in their hobbies. Whatever it is, get to know them as people. And finally, what does a now of work look like? It's belonging. So Agnes, I'm going to tie on to your uh, an analogy there. If inclusivity, which we know is just optics, is being invited to a party, and if, or sorry, if diversity is being invited to the party, inclusivity is being asked to dance, then belonging is when the dance is over to say, hey, that was really dope. Let's be friends. And so you can have as many diverse people you want in the workplace. You can invite them to sit on boards and other subcommittees that you have. But I don't care if it's because of age or the way you look, your religion, your disabilities, whatever. If you don't create a sense of belonging in the workplace, then you failed on diversity and inclusion. And so we're hearing is that. And we got to get past even just, again, the, the, the easy ones to say are women, people with disabilities, First Nations. But my feeling is, is that belonging affects all of us just like mental health uh, wellness does. And that it's, it's everyone is affected in some way and we're seeing it very clearly that a sense of belonging is what this generation is looking for. So, I gotta do a time check because I could go off. I'm trying to go as fast as I, oh, we're on good time. So what I wanted to do was first paint a picture. Paint a picture that there is urgency that the now of work is here, but I think what you're looking for today, if I haven't convinced you already, is what do we do? If you buy into what I'm subscribing today, I would suggest that becoming a more agile organization is a must. I believe that fostering a culture of innovation is just good business sense. And investing in the right tech tools, go Igloo, is something that we all must subscribe to. So let's start with becoming a more agile organization. How many of you have heard of OKRs? Actually, so one, two people. Peter, that's what we taught yesterday. How, so how many actually use OKRs then? So no, okay. So all right, we're going to go back to the drawing board here. So OKRs are not new. They started out with management by objectives and sort of grew into SMART goals. And OKRs was um, introduced somewhere around the 1990s. And startups started really taking hold of around 2000. And so you're going to see a lot of themes here, what I talk about. A lot of what tech startups do isn't actually that innovative. It's just they don't know how to make it sexy. And they don't know how to market it better, actually, than the enterprise used to before. And so OKRs have existed for some time. And by 2010, like I say, when the, the pivot occurred, my opinion is if you're not using OKRs, then you're probably at an opportunity for you to evolve the way you strategize. Because no one's used it before, I'm maybe going to just bring it down a level. Here's what you probably all do. You probably all do an annual planning session and you have an annual strategy. Agreed? You probably also have challenges with, number one, cascading the strategy from the top to the bottom. You can just nod your heads if that's a reality. You probably have a challenge with saying, my non-manager, how does she know she's affecting strategy? And so there's actually, maybe, maybe they know what it is, but then how do, I, how do I contribute to that? And then you lose engagement because they don't know. Or thirdly, along the uh, course of the year, you're not being agile enough and that two, th or two things might happen. One, you see shiny object syndrome. And so you've got a strategy. Then something else comes like squirrel, squirrel, and you gotta go chase something else. Or when an opportunity is meaningful, you don't chase it. The second thing is, so that's number one. I think everyone has that challenge and OKRs can help to solve that problem. My other belief is this, is like so many frameworks that I'll talk about here today and, and are out there, is that you want to modify them to your own business. So I don't always go by textbook. Here's how I use OKRs. My feeling is this, is that most of your companies will have KTLOs, or your organization, your business units. That's your keep the light on uh, initiatives, tasks. Then you have your scorecard or your balanced scorecard organizationally. And everyone has capacity for projects. How are you going to move the business forward? And so throughout the course of the year, we'll come up with different things to help move the business or the business, the business unit or the broader company forward. How I use OKRs is this. I will create, we have very clearly what your KTLOs are. We're very clear on your, on your, on your uh, balanced scorecard items. And then we're going to say, what are the one, two to three rocks that we need to move to get the business going forward? And so objectives and OKRs, which stands for objectives and key results, work like this. Um, so because you haven't used them, let me just wing some here. So if you're in HR, think of maybe your town acquisition team. 
So your KTLOs would be at the very minimum, recruiting requisitions, post it, screen, interview, give a job offer. You have to do that to keep the business running, right? Then you might have scorecard items. This would be things like maybe time to fill, cost per hire, metrics that you're held to to show whether or not you're being effective, agreed? And then over here in your objectives, you're saying, well, hey, maybe we should try this initiative or that initiative to harvest more candidates or maybe get better candidate experience. Well, here's what I would suggest OKRs work. What if your talent acquisition team had an objective of create an amazing candidate experience as an objective? Period. Number one, could not everyone rally behind that? Isn't that simple? Create an amazing candidate experience. And so I always suggest under your objective, and I apologize, I was supposed to have a slide that, that had an, um, an example, but I didn't know what the example was going to be, so I'm just gonna wing it here. But under your objective is a why statement. Like, why is it even important? And that why statement in this example might be because we're going through the biggest or the hiring spree in the history of the company. It might be that the battle for town is so strong, we're only gonna win on the county experience. But whatever it is, tell the why behind the objective. And what do your key results do? They're quantitative measures to say, if I do this, this, and this, I will achieve my objective. So in this example, create the most amazing candidate experience. Key result, hold six open houses with an average MPS of 60. It's measurable, right? Maybe another one might be um, so social media. Say you want to increase your talent social media by 4x. And then I think the more practical ones would be uh, a job offer acceptance rate of 95%. And maybe 100% of your, of your new hires participate in the evolution of the candidate experience. So if you can track what I'm saying without a visual, which I apologize, imagine your talent acquisition team knowing for this year, we're focusing on creating an amazing candidate experience. And that what we're driving toward is those key results. That fundamentally changes the way the offer, everything that they do outside their KTLOs and their scorecard items are rallying behind these objectives versus shiny object syndrome along the way. It's a very different world. But what some of you, I'm seeing some blank stares, I'm thinking some nodding, some of you might think, yes, you know what, I actually do this. Uh, what's so unique, I think with this, it's the cadence. One of the reasons why you don't have buying of your strategy is because you don't talk about it after you do your annual launch or your town hall. In the OKR world, here's what happens. We do six weeks prior to the start of your fiscal. Take your leadership team if you're doing it, you're doing it organizational wide. If it's just your business unit like HR, take them off site. Take them off site for two days if you can afford it. Get them away from their surroundings and really thoughtfully think of what are the rocks that we want to move this year. And when you author those, co-author them with the team, and the annual plan, you roll those out, and then now you've announced those to the broader organization, or if it's your business unit, okay? Now here's what happens along the way. Every quarter, you're gonna create OKRs that are gonna help you to achieve your annual ones. So why would you do that? Because again, the world moves so quickly. And so every quarter, you can focus on some things that you're gonna move the needle on towards there, and then reset each quarter. It allows you to pivot. It gives you permission to pivot every quarter. Then the next case is monthly reviews. Go out for lunch. Breaking bread together, by the way, with your team is super powerful. Go out for lunch with the people in your team or leadership and say, okay, how are we progressing on OKRs? What are the roadblocks that you have? And then every week, I'm big on food, as you can probably see. I suggest you even do a weekly breakfast. Get your leadership team together. Every single Friday, for example, seven o'clock in the morning, we're gonna have breakfast. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the red flags or red lights on any of your OKRs. I wanna hear customer feedback and I wanna hear team member feedback. Every single week. The OKRs will never be lost. Your primary objectives for the quarter will never be lost if you subscribe to this framework and this cadence. And then of course the daily standups, which um, I'm gonna to get to as well in the sprinting. So number one, objectives and key results help to give focus into rocks you want to move. It helps to cascade them down the organization and it helps you to stay focused. You reset your priorities. So use the OKR example. I'm going to speed through because of time here, but here's what happens. You have a manager, or we call you call a scrub manager, you call it a product owner, whatever it is. You will have a backlog of all the items that you want to achieve for this quarter to, to achieve your OKRs. The manager prioritizes those every two weeks. You remember the old world we had, we subscribed to waterfall project management. We said, here's where we start and here's where we're gonna end. 
And how often they do this? They never actually follow that, that Gantt chart. In the sprint world, what we do is we say, every two weeks, we reprioritize our work based on priority and capacity planning. Maybe team members are out for on vacation. Maybe something happened in the market and we need to adjust the way we focus our time. Every one of you guaranteed have priority capacity planning challenges. Sprinting can help solve the majority of them. And so the cadence in this world is this. If you have multiple groups involved, you do what's called a scrum a scrum. And I'm gonna talk about that. Imagine you're if you have a smaller team of marketing, HR, your sales team, whatever, your IT, your finance, all get together at the beginning of the sprint and say, here's what I'm working on the next two weeks. And here's who I need to collaborate with. And you go through this chart, this grid, and everyone agrees, yes, you know what, I wasn't gonna work on that, but seeing that you are, that makes more sense to me. You need my collaboration, I don't have capacity to do that, but I have the capacity to do that. You've just synced your entire department or your leadership team every two weeks. So then after this, what I call the scrum scrum, you go into sprint planning. You could spend upwards of four to six hours with your team just deciding who's gonna do what to achieve the sprint goals all based on the priority of each little task. What I find really powerful for me in the sprint world is that once you've, everyone in your team now gonna know what they're gonna do for the next two weeks. It gives permission to not worry about other things because you know that happens. Every week, what day, what am I supposed to do? Or should I do that or should I do this? Oh, I have this project due. What if you lived in a world where your manager said, this is all you need to achieve this week or this sprint. And if you're done, just go back to the backlog and take what's at top as a priority. The cloudiness that you take away and the stress that you can take away from your team is profound. So then what happens? Public declarations. What I suggest you do, now you go in front of your team. It is science, I don't know what the number is, I'm making this up, but something like 60%, you're 60% more likely to achieve your goals if you declare them publicly. So now, after you do your sprint plan, you walk in front of your team and say, here's what we're gonna do in the next two weeks. And every team does that. Guess what, your level of accountability just went through the roof. You do your daily stand-ups, every day you spend five to 10 minutes with your team saying, what did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And what are your impediments? And the job of the manager now becomes removing impediments because too often we find out problems later on in the process. Can you imagine a world where you're no longer, this is a self-managed team, and as a manager, your job is just removing their challenges and empowering them versus micromanaging them? So what else Sprint can do? And at the end of the sprint, you do a review and retrospective. You could spend four to six hours on this meeting as well, where you sit back and say, what did we accomplish and what didn't we? If we didn't accomplish it, use the five whys. Ask why five times, you'll get to the root of the problem. We'll say, what do we need to start, stop, and continue? What's working, what's not working, and what do we accept? It's a start, stop, continue. And so for the next sprint, not only have you reprioritized your work, you've learned from the mistakes you've made from the last sprint. That's constant improvement. And it's the way that tech companies operate because the pace in which their world is moving. And I have found that you can use that in any one of your business units in any size organization. And at the end of the sprint, you do it all hands. Get people together. If it's a large company, do them in little teams. If it's a smaller company, bring everyone together and celebrate the things that you accomplished. Give public shout outs and high fives. And if you didn't achieve something, tell the team why. But the public declaration that it's all hands, sorry, is a powerful way to reinforce great behaviors and great work and also be vulnerable. So um, sprinting, big thing. Now innovative uh, cultures, um, this is a huge, I'm a huge fan of this image and I probably see it better on your books. What I believe is that if you were gonna do anything today, I've netted out on the left side there my opinions on your four things you should all be doing around innovation. Number one is create urgency. So whether you're gonna reference the Ubers, or Airbnbs, whatever it is, you have to create an urgency that your company and your culture needs to evolve or you will fall behind. Look at the, remember the numbers that I threw out there earlier. Embrace failure. You cannot be an innovative culture if you don't allow people to fail and to celebrate failure. I think if you're a bigger organization, you should align to a corporate innovation program. Um, and thirdly, invest in something like hackathons. And so in the sprint world, what we do in organizations I've been with, either monthly or quarterly at the end of the sprint, we would carve out a full day or two for team members to just hack. Come up with any way to make our organization more innovative. And there's this general rule of thumb out there that you should be spending, it's being challenged by the way, but still it's, it's prevailing, is 70% of your innovation effort should be on your current product and services, 20% should be on product and service adjacent to your market, and 10% should just be random. 
just whatever kind of innovation that's possibly out there, just be as creative as heck and come up with some new innovations. So that's the innovative culture piece. Uh, I'm just gonna whip through tech tools, but here are three that I believe are musts. If you start thinking about those nine characteristics of the, of the connected generation, these three empower it big time. How many of you use Slack? I know someone sitting here was this morning. Raise your hand high. How many of you have heard of Slack? Wow, Teams in Microsoft Teams. Okay, so Slack is, think of it as a instant messaging team collaboration tool for enterprise. This is a company that a few years ago took the tech scene by storm and is now being used by I think 90% of the Fortune 100 companies and is, was one of the fastest tech companies to reach multi-billion dollar valuation in the history. Vancouver founded too, by the way, so Canadian company. Slack is the way people communicate in business today, at least an innovative company. Email, companies, so Slack is starting to harvest these, these stats. Companies that adopt Slack use 49% less emails, have 23% less meetings, and have something like 40% more productivity. Slack is not just for messaging, it also helps you uh, find files, uh, look back fire messages, um, and it's got a ton of AI and machine learning involved. If you don't use Slack, it's free. It's a freemium model, so try it out. And this helps to empower things like transparency, radical transparency. In Slack, I was just at their head office actually, do you know that number one 900 person company have never sent an internal email? Number two is that everyone can even look into the channels of the CEO. You're allowed to see, unless you make it private, what everyone else is doing in the organization. You wanna talk about transparency? This is transparency. When you talk about remote working and people say, well, I can't um, keep in touch with people, Slack. And by the way, with sprinting too, you think of the remote workplace because so many stresses enterprises about, I don't control the team member. How do I know they're being productive? Well, let's go back to sprinting. If every two weeks you know exactly you're supposed to complete, why does it matter, again, where you work? And so these tools empower remote working. 15.5, we talk about communications. So this is in the motive of around 15 minutes each week. Team members answer five questions and managers spend five minutes responding. So you can do pulse checks and you're gonna answer questions like, what are your wins this week? What are your impediments? You're gonna hear me say it a lot. Your jobs and managers is to remove impediments. That's the biggest thing that you can do to help your, your teams be more productive. And 15.5 empowers that. And the reason why I threw them up is because they also just launched a OKR tracking tool, which is pretty neat. And the last one is Trello. So when I talked about before about sprinting and you have your backlog and your sprint item, et cetera, this is just a free and lightweight project management tool. And if you're going to adopt sprinting, I suggest that you uh, use Trello as your initial platform. I also want to talk about design thinking. Um, I'm just now curious about raising hands. Who knows about design thinking? Okay, everyone needs to have their hand up by next week. If there's something now of a takeaway, you need to enroll yourself in a design thinking workshop next week. We talk about human-centered design. Everything now is moving away from, here's what the corporation believes we need to do. Here's what our CEO thinks we need to do. Here's what um, process is driving change. You've got to get to the root of the people, whether it's your customers or your team members. Having empathy and getting human-centric in your decision-making, in your brainstorming, in your ideation. It's also about rapid prototyping. So instead of spending so long trying to get the perfect project, ideate on it. And you can anchor that on design thinking, where you empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test it, bring it back, refine it. Don't get so bogged down on being perfect. So if you haven't tried design thinking, please, next week, go into a design thinking course. I've got a few recommended readings here. Um, if you get an audio book at 2x, you could probably read them, have them all done in about a week. These are table stakes to me. So in the end, here's what I would suggest <clears throat> is that the future work is in fact now. And it's happening through these three forces of the connected generation technology and a sharing economy. It's gonna happen faster than you think, but it's not as scary as you think. And if you can start to believe in the things that are happening in these innovative companies that may feel uncomfortable today, I promise you that you're gonna be more productive in the future. One of the things I failed to mention earlier is that through our studies with university students, with the high achiever, the top talent you want, Guess what the number one sector they want to work in is? Technology. 
the cultures that they're creating, the innovativeness, the flexibility, the tools that they use. It's not about beer taps and the ping pong tables. That culture goes way deeper than that. And if the world's moving that fast, if you can't start to embrace a connected generation that's gonna be 65% of workforce by 2020 and 85% by 2025, then you might have some challenges ahead of you. So I'm here all day, would love to chat with you. I'm happy to hope we all can get LinkedIn by the end of today. Uh, and if we have time, I would love to take questions. But otherwise, thank you very much uh, for your time. <laughs>
company, can we start paying for a premium model of this? And so the buy-in has already occurred. So that's number one. So many technologies, this is why you want your people to be innovative, to try new things, to fail. That's number one. But if you are gonna adopt something, I believe in John Cotter's theory, no matter how dated it is, people will not change if you don't have, number one, a sense of urgency, right? And so if you're going to roll out any new software or change, tell the people the why. If we don't do this, here's what the world looks like. If we do this, can you imagine? Try to be as positive as possible. If we do this, this is what could happen. These are some examples of companies that are doing it. So if you could do that, then I would say this, have a vision. So what does that future state look like? Because some people, people just can't understand them. We fail in our communications when we roll out new ideas that there isn't an end goal that you can actually communicate. And ideally, it's also visual. And then you need guiding coalition. Right? You've got to make sure that you have people throughout your organization who are fully on board. So whether or not they're the fanaticals, your early adopters, you're going to bring them and train them first. Get those people on board as your guiding coalition, and every win celebrate. And if you follow that playbook, you'll find that adoption goes that much higher. But you need to start with a sense of urgency and a vision for that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, easy peasy. I hope that was helpful. I know that was a lot. <laughs>